But in the end, all will benefit. In better homes, better communities, a better America as our heritage to the future. You may not be old to remember it, but in the 1950s, the United States was the undisputed world leader. It wasn't even close. We helped liberate many nations in two separate world wars. Our nation was rich, wholesome, and motivated. There was excitement all over the place, and national pride was higher than it had been since the end of the American Revolution. It didn't matter if it was in the big cities or in the exploding suburbs. Most of the country was happy, healthy, in good spirits, and relatively well off. Today, that is not the case. Many of us are depressed, unhealthy, broke, worried, overworked, underpaid, and super negative. We are a divided nation now, and our power is waning fast. Since recorded history, this planet has seen superpowers rise, rule, and then fall. The Romans, the Greeks, the Assyrians, the Egyptians, the Babylonians, the British. There have been a lot of books written about the fall of once great empires. Each is unique in its demise. The question is, are we next? Look around. The signs are all around us. Our people sleep on the streets. Our young generation is broke and refusing to work and start a family. A lot of our good jobs are gone and many of our former great cities are crumbling. Our population growth peaked. We're divided politically. We're getting fatter and we're getting poorer. Our teachers, our nurses, and our police officers are overworked and underpaid. It's not a bright future. Look around you. There's a lot of signs that indicate our empire is close to coming to an end, if it hasn't already. The decades of U.S. dominance in trade, culture, and morality is threatened. You could say we're just an above average nation now. And that, fellow Americans, is very sad and concerning. What happened to us and is our country in pain? What happened to the great U.S. of A? There is no family so poor, but that the evening meal can be eaten in an atmosphere of warmth and gentleness. There is no family so busy, but that it can come together in the evening for a dinner date, which will give its members something to look back upon with happiness all their days. Of course, things change. That was 70 years ago when things were A-OK -okay in every way. The future was bright back then. Today, it seems like we're directionless. And without direction, we're going to face an uncertain future. It's happening now. We have huge population shifts, racial tensions, job losses, and we're divided. And a lot of that has to do with the decline in morals and values. Our families are breaking up. Almost half of our marriages end in divorce. The average length of a marriage in the U.S. is only seven years. One in six kids in our country lives in poverty. One in four U.S. kids lives in a one-parent household. Some will say that if you destroy the American family, you destroy the country. Studies show that kids who grow up in a house with one parent are more likely to wind up in jail. But it's not just kids from broken homes. Violence and crime around our nation's going up big time lately. You can shoot somebody and not get caught. You can steal and not get penalized. Our police can't or won't do their jobs. They're understaffed and overworked. Our prisons are being emptied. Look at California. It's a total breakdown of law and order. They don't prosecute theft anymore. And in Chicago, people murder each other every day and hardly anybody's caught or punished. Crime is all around us, but we keep our heads down. We kind of have to. Instead, we've become a lot more insular. Most of us are selfish and don't help the greater good anymore, myself included. Americans are becoming more unhealthy and a lot of us can't afford good medical care. Some of us go broke trying to stay alive. We're obese and we're mentally depressed. A lot of us are helpless, homeless, and hopeless. We have a large poverty-stricken population that's drug addicted, but our drug abusers are given more drugs. Our mentally ill are ignored. Our criminals are roaming the streets. Our youth are underpaid. Our seniors are dying off. Does that sound like a world leader? An empire? I don't know if it sounds like one to me. We've overextended our ability to help other nations. We've overextended our ability to help our own people. And not just financially or emotionally. 
We raise taxes to pay for the poor to the point that the middle class is shrinking beyond recognition. A lot of our schools are crowded, led by teachers whose hearts just aren't in it anymore. That is, if they're even certified. In case you didn't know, it's really hard to get a teacher to fill an opening, especially in our inner cities, places where kids need stability more than ever. As a result, our schools just aren't as good as they once were. We're certainly not the smartest or brightest nation anymore. And our colleges are overpriced and they underperform. Now what about our political landscape? Polling indicates Americans feel many of our politicians are immoral and can't be trusted. We've lost faith in our elected leaders and the whole political system in general. Corruption, egos, and greed dominate at the national level. Our politicians redraw maps so they don't ever have to leave office. It's both parties. Trump hinted that he was going to try to figure out a way to overturn his loss in 2020. Before Trump, Hillary said the election was stolen from her. Biden's too old, but he'll never step aside and let a more competent person run the country. And these days, if you don't like what your leader does, you just impeach him. It's just really hard to get any new laws passed because our politicians are too polarized to actually agree on anything. Republicans are going further right and Democrats are moving further left. You can't even debate anybody about politics without getting labeled, chastised, or canceled. Everyone's either a fascist, an anti-fascist, a far-right extremist, or woke. <laughs> We're not organized around a national ideology anymore. Instead, we identify with race, income levels, where we live, or even COVID rules. Rural Americans way out on the country are diehard one way, and urban liberals believe in a completely different thing. I mean, that's not a bad thing. We need different opinions. But today, we don't want to listen to one another. We're so polarized. And we have all these fringe groups trying to divide us. BLM has an agenda. The alt-right has its agenda. School boards are trying to change our schools. Progressive leaders want to take cops off our streets. San Jose is hinting that they want to take away our guns. There's even counties in California and Oregon that want to become their own independent states. Everybody's just pissed off and we're looking to separate ourselves instead of looking for a way to work together. Check this out. More than half of Trump supporters say they somewhat agree they think their state should secede from the union. And 41% of Biden people say it might be time to split up the country too. What the hell, people? Internal fighting's not going to help us any. We're already fragile enough. Look around. You'll see headlines asking if America's facing another civil war. Polling indicates that more than half of us say we're already at the beginning stages of a civil war now. One political scientist researched every democracy since 1950 to look at when they experienced high levels of polarization. The findings concluded that no other world democracy has experienced so much polarization for so long as ours is currently experiencing. The author also pointed out democracies have a hard time depolarizing once they've reached this level. That's scary. It's no wonder so many Americans lack faith that politicians will change their lives for the better. Do elected leaders offer any dreams that we can even believe anymore? Late in the Roman Empire, it got to the point that the throne was sold to the highest bidder. Are we any different? Much of our population is a burden on our society. Our sense of responsibility and accountability are fading. A lot of us have very little obligation even to our own communities. This quote's really insightful. Whoever Aristotle is must be a smart man. It's so expensive in our country now that many of us can't afford to take risks. And taking risks was a quality that helped build this country. Our economy isn't evenly distributed anymore. A lot of our youth can't afford a home or they struggle to pay their rent. It's very hard to get ahead in the U.S. these days. Half a million of us are on the streets and that number's going up hourly. If you can't afford to move, you have to live in filth and your kids have to walk to school on crime-infested streets. All over the U.S., roads are bad and cities are crumbling, but America's cracks go deeper than the pavement. Look around. Many of our former great cities are ruined. Much of that has to do with the loss of jobs. Our corporations have outsourced many of our jobs and automated a lot more of them. But our cities aren't just decaying slowly because of a shift in the economy. We're destroying our own cities ourselves. One incident can cause chaos and disintegration that'll ruin a city forever. No wonder the U.S. population's basically stopped growing. It's hard out there to raise a family these days, especially in places like this. 
We can see how fragile our distribution system is. A virus comes in and we can't get food to the table. We sent all of our jobs overseas to save corporations money and now we can't get things from overseas. If China goes down, we go down. And that's not a world leader. And China doesn't just control our supply chain now. We've allowed them to purchase our middle class homes by the hundreds of thousands. How scary would it be if China took over as the world superpower? You can blame Richard Nixon for that. He helped build China up during the Vietnam War. Dang, Mappy, I didn't realize you were such a political historian, but you're right. Not only did we help train China's military, but we also helped train two generations of their scientists and engineers. Yeah, and then Ronald Reagan helped China too, so that we could have an advantage over Russia. So China beating us now is our own fault. We helped create them. OMG, Mappy. I'm shocked at your political insights. You get an A. Are we still the leader in technology? Sorta. I mean, we sent a man to space, and we invented the assembly line, and we created a lot of advanced technology we use today. Now, other nations are beating us at our own game. Asia has far faster internet, and they have more reliable and efficient public transportation than we do. A lot of cheap technology is made overseas now. What do we even make here anymore? Now, when things started to turn bad towards the end of the Roman Empire, they distracted the people with entertainment. If the people are distracted, they won't focus on how bad things are. Today, we're distracted too. Our attention's diverted by social media, stupid celebrity gossip, and screens. Look around the next time you're out in public. How many people are staring at their screens and not even engaging with the people at their own table? How many hours of Netflix do we watch every day instead of reading about current events? Ironically, you could say the crumbling of America is happening on TV and on social media right in front of our eyes, and we're not even paying attention. So what do we do? Are we past the point of no return? Our nation came together during Pearl Harbor and on 9-11. Is there even anything that could unite us again? Now, no nation's going to come conquer us. Those days are over. But there's a good chance that we're not going to be at the top anymore. You could argue that we're not even there now, and other countries around the world smell blood. Some people really believe that there's a conspiracy theory out there to ruin this country on purpose so the high and mighty can rule. I don't think politicians or the wealthy people running our country really want America to fall, do they? An unstable democracy isn't going to make anybody richer. Maybe we're just returning to a new normal. We had a long run when we dominated the world's resources, but we can't be the best forever. Can we? I do believe that the spirit that made this country great still survives. The lamp is dimmed, but it hasn't been extinguished. Do you think we can reignite that can-do spirit again? Or have we lost our way, people? Okay, everybody, so we have a special guest on. It's Cal Thomas. I'm sure you guys have heard of Cal Thomas. He's an author and a, and a journalist. Hi, Cal. Hi, Mick. How you doing? Good. Thank you for coming on. I'm sure a lot of my uh, viewers have have read your uh, books before and have and your columns. Uh, uh, you've you've been a journalist for 40, 50 years now. Um, and you know, I'm working on a video about the future of the United States. And you've written many books, and one of them is called America's Expiration Date: The Fall of Empires and Superpowers and the Future of the United States. And in the book, you state that the United States is on a downward slope to self destruction and that our expiration date is just around the corner. So Cal, what's wrong with America today? And is it possible that America can really crumble? One of my favorite Ronald Reagan quotes was, uh, we're only one generation away from losing it all, Nick. Uh, democracy, constitutional republic, is not the natural order of things in the world. As we look around the world, we see dictatorships, and not just in Russia and China, uh, we see religious oppression. We see the denial of women's rights. We see uh, religious fundamentalism in places like Iran. And this is the normal state of the world. The United States is an oasis in the midst of all of that. And it doesn't occur naturally. It has to be fought for and renewed within every generation and passed on to the next generation, or we risk losing it. And the reason I wrote America's Expiration Date, it was inspired by the late British diplomat, Sir John Glubb, who studied uh, 3,000 years of human history and found a pattern to the decline of superpowers and great nations. The number one 
contributor to that decline is massive national debt. We just recently crossed $30 trillion in national debt, which would have been astounding to our founders and even to presidents up through Bill Clinton. Clinton left office with a balanced budget of all things. Imagine that, $30 trillion in debt. I mean, people who max out their credit cards know they can't live in debt forever. So we keep doing that. And then another major contributor uh, to the decline of nations is a loss of a shared moral sense, a concept of right and wrong. Now everybody is their own God deciding right from wrong themselves. Even if two people hold contradictory views, it, it only matters that they feel good about themselves. Well, no nation can be sustained without a shared moral value system. So there are other factors contributing, but those are the major two. And we have 20% of the younger generation now, according to Gallup, who declare none when they're asked for their religious faith or background. That's a frightening thing. What are some of the others? So those are the two, those are two big ones, uh, morality and the, and the economy. Um, what are some other um, signs, warning signs that America is about to possibly lose its status well, as the world empire? Yeah, well, I think uh, military overreach, um, you know, we, are, we have not been a colonial power, unlike Britain, for example, or like China wants to be. But we have to decide what our purpose in the world is. Uh, George McGovern, who was a senator from South Dakota in the 1972 uh, Democratic presidential uh, candidate who lost, but he, he said in the middle of the Vietnam War, he was a big anti-Vietnam War uh, uh, advocate, he said, we can't be the policemen of the world. And that's true. And whatever one thinks of Donald Trump, one of the many things that he did, in my view, that was good was to require especially Europe that had lived under America's protection, economic umbrella, and uh, financial largesse for many years to start paying its own bills. And that's kind of an amazing thing. I would also say another contributing factor to the decline of nations is over-reliance on government. The founders wanted government to be limited so the people would be unlimited. But we have half the country now getting a government check. We have in the current administration, wants to, and thank goodness for Senators Kristen Sinema and Joe Manchin, who have stopped this, want to spend even more. And their, their uh, answer to inflation that is harming everybody at the food store and the gas pump is to spend more money when, in fact, spending more money that we don't have and have to borrow is the major contributing factor to inflation. It's like trying to cure alcoholism by giving somebody a bottle of booze. It just, it's, it's counterproductive. So all of these things, and, and there's nothing new about them. I mean, you can study history and see this. It's, it's, not, a, uh, it's not a classified document, uh, but we don't look to the past. I'm not talking about living in the past. I'm talking about learning from the past and then uh, updating things as necessary and moving forward. Why don't we learn from the past? I mean, it's the the book, the playbook on how to create, uh, how to stop empires from going down has been written, and the playbook on how to destroy an empire has been written. So why aren't we following the playbook that has been written before us? Well, the, I like to say the closest we get to history these days is the instant replay. Uh, people are trying to rewrite our history, or they're trying to use the stain of slavery, for example, that uh, that colors everything and statues are being torn down, roads are being renamed, critical race theory is being imposed in some schools. You've seen the revolt in Loudoun County, Virginia, which uh, fueled the election of Glenn Youngkin and uh, Winsome Sears as uh, 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 governor and lieutenant governor. Winsome Sears, African-American woman. I loved her statement on election night. She said, we're not in 1963 anymore, but a lot of people, want to teach that we still are and that we don't have more opportunities for everybody in America than we've ever had, and certainly more than any other country on earth. So the, the public schools have in the last 50 years or so become uh, the equivalent of re-education camps in some communist countries. The universities are mostly shot. They're full of uh, leftover hippies from the 60s, tenured professors who hate America and uh, want uh, their students to do the same. So we, you know, Lincoln used to say, Abraham Lincoln, 
that if America was ever to fall, it was not going to be from an invading army, but that we would do it to ourselves. And he was right. And we are doing it to ourselves. hundred percent, Cal. I agree. Um, you know, the left is getting more progressive. The right is, is, is getting entrenched. I feel like we're more divided politically than we've been in a long time. And you would probably have a much bigger perspective on that than, than I would, but everybody's entrenched into their political parties. How much of the polarization is eating away at us right now? Well, a lot. And uh, it, it pays. I mean, you, you look at uh, some of these cable channels that have guests on. They'll have two guests. One will say to the other, you're ruining America. And the other responds, no, you're ruining America. Well, you're a Bible-thumbing bigot. Well, you're a secular humanist. And the host says, and we'll be back with more civil discussion after these messages. You know, Bob Beckel, who has been a longtime friend, liberal Democrat, we wrote a column for USA Today and a book together called Common Ground. The problem is that so many people, especially in Washington, who have different political points of views or different parties, don't even know each other anymore. There's no party circuit in Washington anymore where people would meet and, and you know, com- commune over the shrimp bowl and go out and have a drink together or whatever. You can't do that anymore because if you, somebody with a cell phone camera takes a picture of you having a dinner with a, another party, a member of another party, they're going to use it against you. So polarization works. It works in fundraising. And, uh, you know, the last thing the politicians in Washington want to do is solve a problem. And you know why? Because if they solve the problem, they no longer have the issue. So everybody knows the solutions to most problems. Reform, Social Security and Medicare, but nobody wants to touch it. Uh, Go through government with an audit and get rid of programs that aren't working and preserve those that are. But you know, again, Reagan used to say the only proof of eternal life in Washington is a government program. And it's true. It's easier to kill a vampire than a government program. If if somebody wants to reduce the rate of increase in spending, not reduce the spending, but reduce the rate of increase, then Nancy Pelosi or some, well, what about the children? Or, you know, you're being insensitive to the poor and the homeless. You seen the homeless in California? They're covering the streets like a plague. This is the result of liberal progressive policies. These people used to be in in places where they could get help. But thanks to the ACLU 40 years ago, uh, which uh, got a court to decide that this was uh, against their uh, freedom, they were let out. So you have metal cases and alcoholics and drug addicts and criminals sleeping on the streets of our major cities, fouling the, uh, the gutters and uh, footpaths with their... Uh, with their excrement and places that people don't want to even go near anymore or hold conventions there. And this is the outgrowth of failed policies, but few people, especially the media don't want to really get to the heart of it. And the media are part of this too. They, they, uh, they foment conflict because they think it's good for ratings. Yeah. I have been to California many times to see what you're talking about and it's tragic. Uh, Los Angeles, you drive, you can drive for, 15 minutes in a loop and it's nothing but tents and homeless people and, and sadness yep. uh, near downtown. And, you know, I've been up to Seattle, I've been to San Francisco and Oakland and there'll be like a mile long um, parking lot of tents and RVs and cars that are lined with people that are just um, either intentionally homeless or, or temporarily or permanently. It's, all, it's just, and a lot of them will tell you, you know, I came here because they have, they give me things to help yeah. me. Um, well, the other the other thing, uh, Nick, is the rapid rise in crime. When you have a uh, loss of a moral sense, when you have no fathers in the home, or very few, when you have district attorneys like Bragg in New York and and uh, you know people in Los Angeles and San Francisco, who will not prosecute uh, crimes over nine hundred dollars, when you see the scenes of looting and even security guards doing nothing. There was a Rite Aid pharmacy in New York, a very famous video that, that went viral, that showed a security guard standing in the store. It had security on the back of his jacket. And this guy loaded up with stuff, taking it out of the store without paying for it. And the security guard didn't do or say anything. And now the store is closed. They can't, they can't afford to exist in that kind of environment. And so this is spreading rapidly around the country. The shootings in the major cities, the murders, Chicago, New York, Houston, the shooting of law enforcement officers, 
who no longer feel safe in their own tr- jobs with government looking over their shoulders and interest groups and activist groups looking over their shoulders. Uh, cops are quitting. Cops are not, young people are not signing up to be police officers. And this too contributes to the erosion of uh, a civil society. Yeah. <laughs> um, now in your book, you said that, you know, we need to make changes at the individual and community level so that the nation can not only survive, but thrive again. What kind of changes do you think we need to make at the community and individual level to kind of get the ship right again? We need to get our kids out of the public schools into home schools or private schools. One of the few side benefits, if you can call it that, of the pandemic has been people who have discovered that they can do a better job homeschooling their kids than the government schools. Now it's a struggle for some people, especially single moms, but if you care about the future of your child in your country, you've got to do it. Uh, I remember something uh, Barbara Bush said years ago, our success as a nation, your success as a family depends less on what happens in the White House and more on what happens in your house. So getting the kids properly educated, historically uh, uh, grounded and uh, morally true is going to produce the kind of individual and citizen that will benefit the nation for the next generation and those following that. So I remember the late Bishop Fulton Sheen, a Roman Catholic bishop years ago said, this was in the 50s, imagine what he'd say now. He said, um, uh, America is not an intolerant nation, as some people say. We are tolerant of everything, and that's what the problem is. Now, you, you remember a lot of quotes. <laughs> well, I speak a lot, so, you know. Yeah. <laughs> so um, which country, who do you think is going to, if if we fall, and, you know, it, the pattern is every 250 years an empire rises and then falls. We're five years from that right now. Um who would take over as the world leader, you think? Well, okay, there's several things about that. I thought you were going in another direction. It doesn't, it doesn't necessarily mean that the United States will cease to exist. So uh, I think the United States might continue to exist, but not in its present form. Look at China. The rise of China is, uh, is phenomenal. Look what Putin is doing with Ukraine. Uh, we are being chat. Look at Iran now, uh, clearly very close to developing and uh, – and launching, if they choose to do so, nuclear tip missiles against the United States, and I mean against Israel, and in some cases the United States. So this is all the result of perceived weakness in the country. And it's not just military weakness, it's moral weakness, it's intellectual weakness. So I think that, uh, you know, the United States will probably continue to exist in some form, but I don't think we're going to be the economic and military and influential country that we have been for 200 and almost 50 years. Uh, and that's, uh, that's a real problem. It's not only a problem for us and our people, it's a problem for a lot of the freedom-loving world, because if the United States doesn't lead, who will? Yeah. Who do you think? I'm curious to know who would be your perfect looking at the political landscape right now, who we have on the on the Republican side, future potential candidates or current folks that are in office. Is there a perfect candidate? Is there somebody that you would trust to get us back on track? That's, well, that's you know, uh, when King David was king over Israel, he said, uh, put not your trust in princes and kings or in mortal flesh that cannot save. So there is no perfect candidate. The, the, to me, the best candidate would, would be uh, someone who said, look, stop relying on government as a first resource and put it back as a last resort. Uh, we want you to have a safety net, but we don't want you to have a hammock. Big difference. So personal responsibility. Look, when I was growing up, I was taught three things. Inspiration, followed by motivation, followed by perspiration, improves any life. Now we flip that and it's envy, greed, and entitlement. If you make $2 and I make $1, you owe me 50 cents to make it fair. That's socialism. I should come to you and say, how did you make the $2? Where'd you go to school? What's your philosophy of life? I want to be like you someday. I don't envy people who make more than me. As a matter of fact, I wrote a column a couple of years ago, tongue in cheek, when the whole idea of income inequality was sweeping the networks and 
the politicians, verbiage and the rest. I said, yes, I, I suffer from income inequality. There are lots of people who make more money than I do. You know what? I don't care. As long as I have the opportunity to work hard and consistent with my abilities uh, to make a decent living to support my family and live a decent lifestyle, I'm content. But uh, this pitting against each other, you know, economically, racially, gender, everything else, this is dividing America. Instead of out of many one, e pluribus unum, we are out of one many. We're hyphenated Americans now. This is not what the founders intended. We can't afford it. We can't continue to go on like this, or we won't. Oh, the legendary author and journalist, Cal Thomas. Thank you for your insight. Uh, the book is America's Expiration Date, The Fall of Empires and Superpowers and the Future of the United States. Cal, you spoke um, wisdom uh, for about 20 minutes straight. And I hope that a lot of people see this and it kind of sinks in because a lot of people need to hear stuff like this, you know. Well, thank you, Nick, for the opportunity. I hope so, too. Yeah. Okay, hey everybody, right now we have Paul Engel. He's an author. He wrote the book, The Constitution Study, Returning the Constitution to We the People. How's it going, Paul? It's going pretty well. Going pretty well. All right. Now, you've advocated that we need to restore our nation to its proper order. What did you mean by that, Paul? Well, most people assume that all power resides in Washington, D.C., and they delegate some to the states, and then they delegate some to the people which is actually backwards. You see, the people created the states when we created the states through the, their constitutions, and they created the United States, a federal government, through their constitution. We actually have a, the, the constitution says we have a limited federal government. There's only a few things that federal government's actually authorized to do. And by putting all that in Washington, we've lost control of it. We don't have... Uh, we, we no longer have effective control over most of what impacts our lives day in and day out. And if we restored it to its proper order, you're dealing with local, then with state, then with federal, well, we, I believe we'd have a, a, we have a lot more of our rights intact and we could all live a happier life. The mess America is in, first of all, we spent well over 100 years making this mess. And the people are responsible because we've done nothing about it. We have sat back and let government go well beyond our consent and powers. Uh, we've actually encouraged our government to go beyond. And as in any other situation, when the government becomes so large and so corrupt, its fall is easily anticipated. The question is, as we see just how uh, how bad things have gotten. Will the American people wake up and realize that we can? We, we need to protect our rights, our freedoms, our liberties. We need to regain control of our government while we can still do it at the ballot box, in the courthouse, uh, in you know, without violence. By the mess. So you said the mess that we're in is, is our fault. What mess are we in? So the mess came from, here's the powers that we gave government, and we have drifted so far from that, that not only does government rarely pay attention to the Constitution, the American people have no clue. Most of them have no clue what the Constitution actually says. And there's a reason why millions of people try to come to this country and have for, uh, what, 150 years? Because this is the place where you could become successful, where any child born here could legally become president, where a, an immigrant could come and uh, uh, create a life for themselves, for their children, that was more prosperous than anything they had in the old country. The, the, uh, the rights that we've had, the private property we could own, the opportunity, the idea of a, this experiment in self-government allowed America to do things no other nation has been able to do. And we w won the war. And we, when we were done, we were left with the only functioning uh, nation with the strength to say, for the world to look at us and say, America, we trust you. We will make the U.S. dollar the reserve currency because we trust you. 
Europe said, we will, we will shed much of our military because we trust you to protect us. And then, of course, then you end up in the Cold War and you've got the... the well, do you, Dale, let me ask you this. Do you think that the world does not look at us and says, we trust you anymore to lead the world um, like they did back in the 1940s and 50s? Is that, is that the case? Certainly not like they did in the 40s and 50s, but more and more, yeah, you're seeing, uh, uh, you're seeing countries look towards, um, well, look at, they're, they're looking to China, right? They're, they're looking to, in, in some places, they're looking to Russia. Um, Germany didn't sign a deal with a Western ally for ga natural gas. They went to Russia. Um, so no, I, I don't think they look at us now. Are we still better than? Are they, do do more countries look towards us than uh, than than somewhere else? Yes, but we're going the wrong way. In other words, the the basic idea of you know we, there's a there's a theory that says our allies should trust us, our enemies should fear us. Think about it. How many of our allies truly trust that America is going to do the right thing right now? And how many people, how many of our enemies are afraid of what America is going to do? And this isn't simply a thing for the last year. This has been going on for years as we've become caught up in our own, uh, uh, our own self-reinforcing turmoil. What would you say about, so how much of the fall is because of our manufacturing going overseas when we started shipping all of our jobs um, out of the country? Well, there's, there, there's, there's actually two parts to that because uh, at least from my point of view, uh, the reason we, so many of the jobs went overseas is because it was cheaper. It simple math. It's cheaper. It was cheaper. I, I read this article. It was ama it amazing when I read it. But um, it was cheaper for Texas chicken farmers to ship their chickens to China to be butchered, packaged, and shipped back than it was to have them actually processed in the United States. Did they do that? Yeah. Why don't they just go down to Mexico? It's a lot closer. Because it was cheaper in China. It was cheaper in China than Mexico. It was just, it, it, don't, know the, don't know all the economics. I, just, I read this article, and I was – a bit shocked, but uh, the consequence of that is um, our, we, we saw the consequence with the supply chain where we are so dependent on things coming from overseas that that becomes a choke point. Now, that's, that is actually, that, that's part of the story. The other part of the story is we've spent so much time and effort and money. And again, I'm talking as a society trying to live the way we did in the last century. Um, the, uh, the, the days of getting a job at 18, working 40 years, retiring with gold watch, they're gone. The days of, uh, you know, uh, you know, I remember Walmart did a, a, an experiment because, uh, you know, Walmart buys, gets a lot of their stuff from China because it's cheap. They actually put Made in America stickers on all the products that were actually manufactured in America because they wanted to see, would, the, would that increase? They said, hey, that will increase the sales, right? Because we're all patriotic. We want – no, the sales went down. Did the price, was the price the same? I don't remember all, all, all the details. Right. Right. Um, but we used to be American, – American-made used to be – uh, uh, it used to be a symbol of quality. In the seventies, we kind of lost that, right? You could get better cars made. Cars were made better and cheaper in Japan than they were here. There's still a lot of manufacturing in the United States. It tends to be the more, as I understand it, the more highly technical, the more involved, the more, you know, we're not making sneakers and t-shirts, Um we make some computer chips. We design several things. How, does it really matter that we're maybe not going to be number one in the world anymore? Should we even really care? I mean, what would it what would it mean for 
the country? What would it mean for the world if, if we're not number one, if we're, if we're not the best big bad empire like we once were? Well, there's a saying that he who pays the piper calls a tune. The person, the, the, the country that becomes number one, the, the, the largest economy, the biggest military, the most influence, um, they set the, the standard. So think of it this way. Uh, I forget what it was, who was who said it, but think of how many wars that America has fought. Um, we may not agree with all of them, but how often have we fought a war to help somebody else and then left? And all we asked for, as I think it was Colin Powell said, all we asked for was a plot of ground to bury our dead. Do you think a Russia or a China would do that? And I, I, I spend every day writing about the problems in America. Ultimately, um, we, we will frequently fight to protect other people and not ask to get paid back for it. Would you rather have the, the world run by America as we used to be, America as we are, or Russia or China? Where do you think you would have the, the, the most opportunity to live a, a happy and successful life? Not China. So what, if there was one thing you could do to get the country turned in the right direction again, what's the first thing that you would do? The first thing that I would do, I think regardless of whatever, whatever else gets done, I think we need a the, the American people need a bedrock of education. We need to understand. And I think a lot of that's because we we deal a lot with emotion, but not necessarily with facts. There's no we don't know uh, what our rights are, and we don't know about the importance of protecting other people's rights. If you don't have the right to live your life as you want, then how much else really matters? I mean, I'm with you on that. I, I, I think that th I do agree with you on the fact that we need to be educated about, you know, where we're headed and where we've been and what the implications could be. I just don't really think most of us really seem to really care. I mean, we put our heads down. We're distracted. Um, we're, things are handed to us. The motivation level is down. Everybody's complaining. Everybody seems like they've got a gripe. Um, I, I don't see any leadership standing up that has our interests in mind to try to get America back in order again. So I don't think it matters how educated we are. I don't think people are, a lot of people are, I don't think upset about their rights. They just want to be left alone um, and just want to just live a, an average to above average life anymore. And I think that's a big part of the problem. Well, it's interesting because I agree that most people are ignorant and apathetic. They, they don't know, they don't care. But the very thing you say they want, which is to live their life unhindered, unmolested, and make it better than before, is one of the basic core rights protected by the Constitution that very few Americans actually realize. It's this idea that you are, you're not to be deprived of your liberty, your ability to live your life without external influence, except as absolutely necessary for the safety of society. Those are the rights that the Constitution was designed to protect. And if you don't learn how to protect them, your right to live as you see fit evaporates. Okay, guys. So right now I'm being joined by Erin Tolini. She's an entrepreneur and an attorney and a former politician. How, how's it going, Erin? Hi, I'm doing well. Thanks for having me. Good morning. Yeah, thanks for coming on. So I'm, I, I've been doing, um, you know, some, some thinking and some pondering about, you know, the, the future of our country. And there's a lot of discussion um, online that's been going on for years about where is America headed? And, and there's some pundits out there that kind of feel like America has peaked and our empire may be coming to an end. Um, how, how confident are you about the future of the United States, Aaron? Well, I definitely think the United States is at an inflection point right now. I think there has long been some polarization that has only increased as of late. COVID, I think, accelerated it. So I really do think, you know, the United States is at a point where we have a lot of problems. I mean, as Abraham Lincoln famously said a long time ago, a house divided against itself cannot stand. And I think 
we are in danger of being at that extreme sense of polarization where the United States has a really hard time getting things done. And I think that is reflected in a lot of the political discussions we see happening today. That being said, I do think that there are reasons that the United States has held its superpower status since probably about since World War II. And even though I think we have 99 problems, I do think that um, we will not have, I, I don't think that there is a nation that is currently poised to overtake us in that superpower status. Mm -hmm. Why are we so polarized? I know social media, my take is we were already kind of going there and then social media, especially Facebook, just like totally divided people even more um, into their different camps. Um, but you know, besides social media, how, why do you think we're, we've become so um, polarized and divided politically? I think there's a few things. I think, first of all, unfortunately, a lot of people who get into politics are driven more by ego than by actually wanting to make people's lives a better place. I have long said that local politics is a place where politics still works. And for the most part, I think the people who get involved in local politics really want to make a difference. They are involved in their community. They run into people in the grocery store that are affected by their decisions. And it's that immediate feedback loop. Whereas I think in national politics, you have less of that and you have people who really tend to grandstand and get their egos involved and really put an emphasis on getting reelected over trying to do something that benefits their constituents. I think a second thing is the press. I think um, a lot of people on both sides have lost some faith in the press. I think that the press tends to go for ratings and shock value. And a lot of times negative news is what sells. And then I do think social media exacerbates it. I think people who are in fear tend to cling to what they know and they don't, they're not open to hearing other perspectives. And I think that there has been a lot of fear, especially in the last couple of years. What would you do? I know that like, that's a question that you could ask anybody and maybe there's a million different answers, but like, if there's one thing that you could, that you think you could, you would do, or we could do to kind of get things kind of pointed in the right direction again, is there, is there one thing that kind of stands out that you think it, it would help the most with our nation? I don't know that there's one thing, a couple of things. I'll, I'll give you a couple of things. Yeah. I think who we elect matters. I think when you elect people who you can tell are in it for their egos, that can't end well. I think when you elect people that really seems like their agenda is not to be reelected, but really wants to help our country progress and is willing to reach across the aisle and try to find compromise, I think that really matters. Um, I think choosing what media you consume matters, trying not to kind of find the echo chamber or the, the, th the people screaming out headlines and arguing and not really trying to find a path forward, but trying to chase ratings. I think that matters. Mm -hmm. Look, where are those people though? I mean, <laughs> we, we keep saying we need to elect leaders that care and like, you know, and I agree with you, but like, you know, the, I do see there are people that you you hear about grassroots that you you believe in that person and you're like, man, I would support that guy. Um, and then they just never make it. I don't know if the system just keeps them down or they can't get. I mean, is that part of the problem is just the people that do care that have our intentions that are best that aren't in it for themselves just can't get to the top because of the way the system's just designed. Is that I mean. I do think from a former politician standpoint, too. Yeah. No, I do think there's some truth to that. And honestly, at different times, people have tried to get me to run for higher office. And that has been a little bit of my hesitancy is I don't know if I could govern the way I want to govern and still get elected. So I think that th that is part of it. People, I've read a lot about people's ideas of how to fix it. And some of it is, you know, move to um, rank voting where it's not just the top person takes all the votes, but then a second person who may not be one of the two party candidates could come in and take away enough of the vote that they could be a real contender. Um, I think, you know, the, the gerrymandering that's happening on both sides is making everything worse Then now the amount of competitive seats is so low. It's just basically predetermined which, which district is going to go to which party. Um, and honestly, I, I think part of it are the politicians who are in charge. I've heard stories of, as soon as you get elected to the House of Representatives, they pull you into a room and say, you vote along party lines. I don't care what your conscience says. I don't care what you think. 
doesn't matter. You vote along party lines and you don't ever stray from that. And I think that's a shame. And that it, it needs, it need, I think it needs to change at all levels from who personally we elect and what types of policies we vote for to the very top where um, our top politicians say, no, enough, enough of this. It's time that we put the country first. Mm -hmm. Does it even matter that we're so like clearly America has probably peaked in terms of its prosperity and its social status and its impact on the world and our own morals, I would, I would say. Um, but like, does it even matter if we're number one? I mean, can we just be above average? Is it really, do we really have to impress the world? Like, how do you feel about that? I do think it matters. I think whoever is number one kind of sets the stage for global politics. And I think that matters. Um, I wouldn't necessarily agree that we have peaked. I definitely agree, like I said earlier, that we're in an, at an inflection point. I do think the United States has kind of peaked at GDP growth and China, like I said earlier, is probably going to overtake the United States. But I don't think that that's necessarily a bad thing. I think any developing country is going to have a long on-ramp for high GDP growth until they kind of hit the full employment and full technology and all that kind of thing. And the United States was at accelerated GDP growth through, you know, the Industrial Revolution, the time as we were up and coming as a nation, and we've definitely stabilized. And I don't think that that's a bad thing. I think that we have a high quality of living. I think that people can come here from just about every country in the world and say, wow, these people live nice lives. And I think that as long as that exists and we have freedoms and freedom of speech and, you know, the ability to chase the American dream, which some would argue is not as strong as it once was, but I do think everyone would still say there are some opportunities to chase the American dream. I think that the United States is always going to be an attractive destination for people around the world. And hopefully we can continue to attract people who want to start businesses and invest in technology and study at our schools. And I think as long as we have those types of things um, that will continue to maintain both our our economic and military power and our soft power. Hey everyone. So it's pretty clear by now that elected leaders aren't going to help you. If you don't like what you saw in this video, demanding change won't work. You're going to have to do it on your own. If you want to be safe and want your community to be a place where people want to live, you're going to have to clean the place up yourselves. You're going to have to work with your friends and neighbors to lower crime. Politicians clearly don't care as much anymore. It's up to us. This is Sage Nick's manager. This has been a Corner House Entertainment production. Are you looking to move and need advice? I do consulting. That's right. I'll sit down and talk about where the next perfect place for you and your family should be. I do it all the time. Together, let's find you a new home that's safe and checks all your boxes. You can get my email in the description to find out how I can help you find your perfect relocation. And I can also help you find your new house too. Email me and I'll work with you on not just helping you figure out where to move, but I can help you find your perfect home too. That's right. 